So we're going to switch now from uh, earlier we did uh, um, property traps, um, technology diffusion, um, capital investment plus uh, wealth distribution and, and democracy and provisioning for ending poverty, eliminating poverty traps or reducing their size. Okay, we, we did all that over the last two days. Um, now we're going to return to the sustainable development idea, okay? And I'm going to do a little bit of review here to re remind you because I know I spread these ideas across three chapters. Chapter one, we talked about, um, you know, effective population size and development on uh, the tragedy of commons. Um, chapter two, in social justice, we talked about regulating uh, utilization um, to some equal point um, to reduce uh, or yeah, reduce the inequality of utilization. Uh, and now what we're going to do is we're going to try to um, make another step here uh, to manage utilization dynamically to avoid the tragedy of the commons, independent actually of population size, at least to some extent. Okay, so that, that presents a really a rather large challenge. Okay, so. Um, Remember the tragedy of the commons uh, says that if we all unthinkingly use some resource such as the grass and a pasture, it gets eaten up and we destroy the pasture and nobody has anything. Okay? So you might also remember we had resource and dynamics and utilization dynamics and they depend on development, wealth. Remember there's a very important idea that says that uh, rich people pollute more. Um, you did your personal ecological footprint, you came out at I came out at 3.7, I don't know what you came out at, but you came out at some high number relative to um, what we really should be, because our number should be at 1.8. Um, if everyone in the world had less than 1.8, we'd, we'd be fine in terms of use of resources. Um, and then the, the second crucial issue is population size. Population's going up. Um, you know, people predict it might end up at 9 billion, but nobody knows. We're at 7.2 billion um, this year. Last year when I taught the class, it was 7.1 billion. So we're going up, and uh, that means if you have more people, more people use more resources simply because we eat more or whatever else, and uh, we pollute, okay? And so we are causing a heavy load on um, the environment. So remember we had an environmental justice policy, okay? And we'll talk about that more in a minute. And we showed that for fixed resource dynamics and population size, it could avoid the tragedy of the commons. Okay? So that's good. But the problem is, I say, what if, what if these change? Well, what does these mean? What does these mean? It means, well, if the resource dynamics change, in other words, uh, or the utilization changes, the utilization, we start getting rich, the poor people start getting richer and richer and richer, they start polluting more and more and more. What happens then? And what happens if we get more and more people in the world? There's are two problems, actually. Okay. So what if those change? How are we going to manage that situation? So let's recall a, a bit about the dynamics. So we had this renewable common resource RFK at step K. Um, N was the number of users. And then we had these dynamics uh, right here. Um, and you remember these dynamics. They, they sort of, all they really do is go like this, right? I mean, it's not a big deal. Um, and uh, this R was the rate, so that says how steep this is going up. Um, K was the carrying capacity. You're starting to see why I'm using that K number. When you look at the poverty trap, with the, the K and the, the poverty trap in the um, technology diffusion dynamics, everything went up to K, okay? So this guy goes up to K, actually. You can show it simply that that number there turns out to be the ultimate value of R of K as K goes to infinity, all right? And so UK, this guy right here, is the total util utilization at step I. That's all users together. Um, now, remember, there's two things. There's development impact on utilization, or you could say ending poverty, its effect on utilization. Well, three countries pollute more and use more resources. Pollution, there's a pollution impact on utilization, so there's more people implies more pollution and more resource use, and both of those are really significant problems. What they do is they drive up individual utilization and therefore total utilization, right? That drives R down. That's the resource coming up, OK? 
Okay? It's sort of, it's as simple as you've got a cow pasture and there's grass in the pasture. If you have more, send more cows out, that means you're raising in, right? The number of cows. And if you have bigger, fatter cows and eat more, 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 then they're eating it faster and you deplete the resource faster in both ways, okay? Um, so the question becomes, is will you create a tragedy of the commons? Under what conditions will this happen? So for individual utilization, UI of K, um, the total utilization looks like this. Um, we have UK being the sum of UIK and it lying between zero and one. And if you remember why that was, is we, it, it's, it comes back to this equation um, here. So it, it has to do with if you multiply through, through by R into here, if this is one, then you minus off R and you have this guy, and you quickly deplete. Now, Alex, why don't you tell them what you did in your home? You, he, Alex submitted a homework for fun, changing the problem. Why don't you describe what you did? Um, so instead of having U of K be there inside those big parentheses, um, I basically moved it outside and made it an absolute utilization rather than relative utilization. So it's no longer a percentage of R of K, but it's just some fixed value some value of uh, the resource. Uh, and when you do that, you can you see that there's actually kind of an, uh, there's a trick point uh, at roughly halfway between zero and K. Um, and when you get past that trick point, you very quickly destroy the confidence. Thank you. So there's a, this is, and that's a very reasonable model. You see his model, his proposed model is Right? It's a reasonable model. Because in a certain sense, it's not like, how can we get everybody to agree to only use a percentage of R of K? Right? So what Alex is saying is, is well, no, you can't. Yes? So for that model, if you're past the trip point, would your resources grow? Your resources would be growing, be growing past the reason, so they just grow and bound it? Past the trip point. You mean more than the trip point? Yeah, yeah. No, it's, go ahead. So basically, the growth of R in absolute terms um, sort of follows this parabolic function where it, it, at zero, it has zero growth, and at K, it has zero growth. And in the middle, there's a point where it, it produces the most every time step. And, and that essentially is your trip point. So when you are utilizing more than the most that the resource can produce, you, you deplete. Time step, you, you break, you'll, destroy the commons. you'll destroy the commons and pass that trip point. Right, but if you're on the other side of that, in every time step you are producing more than you're using, your resources are going to go up. On one, one side of the trip faster. point, they go up, but the yeah, other yeah. side. But as RK, R of K increases, the rate that R of K increases oh, decreases. Oh, so, yeah, I see. Does that yeah. make sense? Yeah. Yep. Okay, thank you. Um, so we have individual utilization dynamics that look like this. They just look like the, the, the resource dynamics. And uh, so you, we can have rate and capacity parameters for each of these. Those are the RUI, KUI. So if you're a really poor person, your KUI is really low. You're not going to be using much resource. RUI says, you know, if, if RUI is really low, then you're not going to increase the rate of utilization very fast either. Um, so you can model this. And then um, remember we did this. This is a plot from chapter one. So in this plot, ignore the left column for a minute. We discussed that in detail before. But um, here, for the, um, this is the low utilization case. So this is when u of k is equal to small constant. And uh, if you start below the k value, um, what ends up is you go up and if you start above it, it goes down just like we talked about before. Now on the other hand, uh, for high utilization, if U is too high, then um, everything comes down, you pass the trip point, you destroy the commons, okay? Um, now, what I want you to realize though is there's a lot of assumptions here. First of all, I'm assuming the number of ones, that is the number of people, is fixed. If it increases, that corresponds to population increases. Everything changes here, number one. And number two, if uh, the converged 
if it converges to a different point, of course, um, all bets are off too, because if it converges to a higher point, you have higher utilization. Uh, I'm sorry, it, it, not this one, but the utilization curves that aren't here converge to a higher point. This will converge to a lower point and possibly destroy the columns. Okay. Um, so remember we did this. We did environmental justice policy. And, and uh, I'm going to talk through the ma mathematics to remind you a little bit, but I'm also going to try to highlight a few things. Um, so we said that there was some constant utilization. Um, this is a hypothetical one, uh, and uh, we said it depended on K. But remember, in chapter two, we made it a constant. We didn't make it depend on K. It was constant for all K. We're going to change that now. So if the utilization is less than UC, what do we do here? Well, this is the, what the utilization is the next step. So usually that's going up, right? So it tries to go up, but it hits. It jumps above UC. I cap it at UC. This mitting this operation between these two means that whatever is the min one is what comes out. If this goes over this, well, then this is where the min's achieved, and I get UC out. If, if on the other hand, um, this is well above this, then this will come out, and the utilization will just continue to increase. Like, if you're a really poor person, you're your KUI is, is small and you're only going up a little bit, you're way well below UC, this min will never be achieved. This will just chop off and it will just be this piece. Okay. Now, if UI is um, greater than UC, here's the thing. Here's UC. This first term is UI minus UC. UI is greater than UC, so this number is positive. So I got UI up here, UC down here. I form a difference, I multiply by alpha between 0 and 1. What does that do? Well, that just says reduce this by some amount. And at the next step, let that be the new UI k plus 1, because I add on the UC. So what happens here is, as I say, the ones that are utilizing too much, you've got to reduce the difference by some percentage. You should think, oh, that's like wealth distribution policy. Yep. Only now, I make everything relative to this UC. Okay? Keep it really simple. Is everybody okay with that one? What should happen? I mean, if UC stays here, U, U, UI is up here, I reduce it one step by, let's, let's say, you know, alpha is some number that such that I reduce to 80% as much. Well, I'll reduce down to here. I reduce by 20%. Well, the next step, I reduce by 20%. It goes down, right? In other words, UI will approach UC as K goes to infinity. Okay? Um, and if you plug in this case, of course, this is zero, and you get UI equal to UC, and you stay at UC. Okay, that's just the pathological case. So, um, and we did. We, I just took UC, put it at 0.01 for K here to zero. I spent alpha equals 60 for a 60% reduction term. And we considered the policy in no policy cases, and this is what we came out with. Remember on the top left plot, we had utilizations UI. So you look at this plot, and the, these, these curves that are down in here represent probably poor people. They're using very few resources and maxing out very few resources. Then there's people like us at the top there, polluting like crazy. Okay, and then if you follow policy, the policy you see is this big fat green line. And it says, somebody comes up with this thing. They, some world expert says, we can't be utilizing more than this or we're going to destroy the commons. And so they tell everybody, okay, there's one of two possibilities. If you're above the green line, you got to decrease. If you're below the green line, you can continue to increase. So what happens then is, is these guys above the line start decreasing they hit the line. These guys either go up and hit the line and stay at the line, or they never even reach the line. Those are really poor people that aren't polluting much. You don't bother them. So if you look at it, if you thought of this in terms of money, you'd say, well, do we get equality in the end of money across people? No. It's inequal. But 
it's a big difference because in the beginning there's a huge inequality utilization. Now the inequality is limited to that much. That's a realistic objective for environmental justice. Absolutely equal utilization, I think, is not a realistic objective. Probably not wealth either. Well, certainly not wealth either. Then we talked about these in the various cases and talked about having the policy versus not having the policy. So blue corresponded to having this policy. Red correspond to having no policy. That's this guy. So this is the red case correspond blue case. Well, the red case causes a tragedy. The blue case does not. Why? Because we reduced all these guys' utilization. Okay? So that's where we were. Now, here's the thing. You see it is now going to become UCFK, and we're going to dynamically adjust UCFK, all right? And you say, why? Well, here's the thing. You know right now that if I increase the number, the, this is, I think this is 200 plots. If I increase it a lot, well, you know there's going to be more utilization. So somehow, this line is going to have to do what? It's going to have to come down. It's, it's got to somehow. Assuming you can measure population, which is a pretty reasonable assumption. Um, also, if we had a difference where uh, people were utilizing, were going higher, utilizing more, we might have to reduce it too. But there's a beauty in this because it's not only that you might reduce UC, you might actually turn it up. Because if you find out, well, your population didn't increase so much, well then we can all pollute more. Or poor people didn't get as rich so they're not polluting as much, so we can all, all sorts of people can pollute more. All right? So we're going to be dynamically adjusting this line. The objective will be how to dynamically adjust that line so that this doesn't happen, no matter what. In other words, no tragedy to the commons. Okay? Now you can see that's, this is a difficult thing to do because you don't know what the population is going to be. All right? I mean, you, you don't know what the population is going to be, and you have to design this in spite of that. You don't know how fast poverty will end. You have to design this in spite of that. Do you see the problems analogous to trying to design cruise control on your automobile? It's got to regulate the speed to 55 miles an hour in spite of the hills that come up in the future, right? You don't know what hills you're going to go. You don't know where you're going to drive. So it's still got to be able to regulate that. So we're going to use a feedback control system to do this. Um, it's going to look like this. So I'm going to so we can sense the resource, R, and we're going to adjust UC. And this is the resource utilization slash dynamics. I'm going to put in an RS, and we'll find the difference between, that's just a constant, minus R is equal to E, and then the policy adjuster or controller has got to take the error and produce a UC. Okay, that's what's got to happen. It's going to adjust it up or down. Now, RS is simply going to be a number bigger than the tragedy of the commons, right? Something like that. And um, the challenge here is, is this is like the world uh, environmental situation. This guy is the challenge, right? You've got to design that as an engineer. So now the policy is not just EJP like before the environmental justice policy. It becomes a dynamic EJP. So somebody in the UN or whatever says, Maybe K corresponds to years, and they say this year, UC has to go down this much. Implement the law. Next year, it comes up a little. Goes up, down, it's trying to regulate this R to match this guy, so this E goes to zero. That's the objective. Okay? Um, so let's see how, how you do that. Um, So here's my uh, proposed controller. I take E, it's RS minus RK, and I, I, I um, define the, the next step, UCK plus one, to be this. Well, okay, so the first thing is, is I take the max was zero. Well, big deal, ignore that. And all that does is make sure I don't move UC below zero. Obviously, I can't do that. Now, this term here, I want to make, this says, so I'm ignoring the bracket on uh, UCK plus one is, well, UCK. I'm going to leave it the same, except for I'm going to modify it by some increment. 
And what I modify it by is beta times the sine of Rs minus Rk. Now this is very, very simple. This is the first thing you try, okay? But think about this. Whenever you see that, you first want to know what sine means. And it's just what it looks like. It's the sine of the argument. If the argument's positive, the sine, it's 1, it returns 1. If it's negative, it returns a minus 1. And if it's 0, it returns 0. That's their convention in MATLAB. So if I have, the common case here will actually be RS lower than R. So the common case will be this number minus this number. This, uh, this guy here will um, be negative. So this will be negative. This is a positive number. So this will be a positive. So you'll increase UC. OK? But if, if, so keep that in mind. What does that mean? That means, well, I'm way far away from causing a problem with the tragedy of commons. So I'll increase UC. Well, I'll live fat and happy. And pollute more. On the other hand, if this number is below this number, we're in a really bad situation. If this number is below this number, uh, then what happens? This becomes positive. That means uh, this will be a positive one times beta. So we'll minus. So we'll move you C down. Oh, perfect, right? Move you C down because I've got to end so much utilization so that we avoid the tragedy of the commons. Remember, RS is not um, where the trick point is for the tragedy commons. I can pick it above it. Okay? Everybody okay with that? That is like, you know, this is, what kind of controller is this, anyone? It's like a proportional controller. Now, I, of course, I could put a PID in here like we did for wealth. It's like, why bother? It works, you're going to see in a minute, it works good. Okay, so simple proportional control idea. Very simple idea, but very effective as you'll see in a minute. So here's the way it performs. Now the top plot, all right, K is along the horizontal axis. R of K is the top plot. This is UC, the adjusting of the fat, fat green line. And then UI is right here, okay? Let's start at the top. So the blue line is, is R of K. Um, so what we have here is um, this point here is RD. You don't want to hit that point. I chose RS to be 10 above. And then uh, watch what happens. The resource use comes down, 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 and settles right out. Okay? No problem. To do that, though, in the beginning, what it's doing is, is it starts out and says, okay, you can use more and more and more and more and more. But as you're, you notice that the slope of this line going up means this line's going to go down, right? Because I'm increasing utilization. No problem. But then look what it's doing here. It's going down, up, down, up. Why? Because it's regulating the blue line around that point. Okay, it's a little bit below. You know, blue is a little bit below the dotted um, line, um, what you have to do then is, is you have to lower utilization. When it gets above it, I gotta raise utilization, I can raise utilization, and so on. Okay, so it oscillates right around that line. Now, what's cool is, does that plot in the bottom make sense to you? That's the utilizations. Um, so remember, now all you have to do is think about UC as like a cap, right? A cap that works after the rich the polluters reduce. And once they get there, the cap, everybody's trying to push up against the cap, except for the non the really low polluters, okay? And it's going up and down, so you see it's an envelope, right? It's an envelope for um, what's allowed in terms of utilization. And it's that easy. Now, that's kind of cool. I mean, it's got dynamically adjusting policy, but it's not really cool yet until you do a few other things. This is the population size of n equal 200. That's what I had used before, always. And what I'm going to do, I, I, I just, I don't know how much I could increase. So I don't know what it's going to turn into. But the key point here is I designed the policy, environmental justice policy, in this feedback system for n equal 200. So what I thought to myself as I'm sitting in my computer, I'm going to break it. 
We'll make it n equal 400. Okay? Just double the population. So look what happens when I double the population. So right away, UC is going down because it's saying, man, we're using way too much. And this guy starts going down and it just almost gets there. It almost violates the constraint. And then it comes back up because by here, it's decreasing utilization. So it allows it to recover and then it regulates. You see, it's bringing utilization down and then it settles out. So in a certain, you can guess what's going to happen for all the values of population between 200 and 400, right? I mean, it's going to work. Now, I didn't try to really break it, but you can break this thing, right? Obviously. If you keep cranking up, you can break it. And you notice that um, I sort of got lucky because I chose this difference to be 10 here as a safety margin. And it turned out to work for this doubling from 200 to 400. But it wouldn't necessarily here because this sort of thing is going to happen because when you fix the beta parameter, that fixes how fast this UC will go down. And I didn't increase it much. It's, it's a pretty small value. Now, of course, if I increased it, I could get it to go down faster to avoid this dipping down here near the danger point. Okay? But I, I mean, I didn't need to do that. Okay, again, you see at the bottom that the, the guy is uh, regulating this within an envelope, Radika. So, so for both of these um, models, you assume that your population is constant for the entire time period, right? Yes, I am. So then, is what would happen? To, like, I know we're making babies every day. Like, yes. By whatever the rate is, one point two. Um, I think it's a fantastic idea to study. Can you turn it in with your homework? <laughs> no. Um, Yes, what's, I think what will happen is what you would expect to happen, as long as you don't move and dynamically too fast. Um, but uh, yeah, certainly that, that is the, way, the right way to do it. It, it is indeed to have um, an uh, follow-up population growth curve that looks something like that, yes. Um, and I think it would, uh, it would do as you say, I mean, if it went up here, actually, it would help us, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> because if we, if we slowly increased, we wouldn't have this dip down so low. And, you know, things would be kind of, you know, tougher later. But I think it would actually make things better. Um, okay. Yes? Just following up my question, how do you actually uh, fix the safety point for, like, how do you know what is safe? Well, I'd say that it's pretty hard. Because the, um, that safety point, um, I just did it, okay? And the problem is, is that in control systems analysis, we're not very good actually at dealing with transients. That's a transient dip, undershoot, you can call it. And uh, analysis doesn't handle that very well. We're good at the, the proving things at the steady state, for instance, not transient. That pretty much applies across dynamical systems in many, at least in many ways. Um, I think the only way to do, I think it would be very difficult actually to pick a good, w w something you were confident in. So is it often like using the trial and error technique? Well now you see the problem with this system is uh, trial and error isn't going to work because if it's a, uh, if you commit the error you're done. Everybody's toast. So now unfortunately I think, the way I think it would have to be done is you'd have to look at this rate of decrease and, and you'd have to um, do analysis up in that region and show that you're not going to have a problem. But I, all I'm saying is that's going to be a difficult analysis. Anybody else? Okay. Um, okay. Next. Uh, discussion. So there's all kind of, I, I like to you know show dynamics and discuss this and it's kind of cool. I mean it, it works out nicely, but you know I also want to frame um, what I'm presenting in the context of what we know and what we don't know. There's a lot we don't know here. Um, I had difficulties finding good literature on on dynamical models of the commons, for instance. Um, and in particular, I could not find anybody that had a mo an accurate model of 
the environment for this kind of situation for the commons. So if the model is no good, the analysis is no good, of course. Okay. Second of all, there's a pretty big problem here because I'm considering one resource. And the reality is it sort of everything's connected to everything else in many, in many cases. Um, you know, if you're depleting, a, if you're screwing up the environment, like let's say the air pollution, climate change, and so forth, you're, you're also polluting um, water, the oceans. Um, there's very many interactions there. We talked some of, about some of those in chapter one. And you're also polluting soil. It's, and if you pollute soil, you, you end up polluting water because of runoff. So it's a huge mess to be able to model that sort of thing. And I, I think it would be, um, it's only accurate to say that this is just a baby step in trying to think about sustainability. But I think it's a useful one. Useful one. Um, so there's, there's different resources, and then the resources are coupled. So if you think about it, it's like a problem that's sort of like this. You've got a bunch of resources that are going up like this, and they're being punched down. And if you punch one of them down, you may hurt another one. Okay? And what you're trying to do is um, not lower them all at the same time too much based on very complex usage patterns by people. Um, remember the game Whack-A-Mole, where you go to um, Chuck E. Cheese or whatever, and the little, little guy pop their heads up and you hit them in the head? So this is basically a problem like that, um, only the problem is you have a group of kids that are trying to push them all down at once, and you don't want them to push them down too much. You want to allow them to sort of stay up. Okay, that's, that's the way the dynamics really are working. It's a very complex dynamic that's going on. Okay, next, um, let's assume no resource degradation from other sources. So the problem here is, is this is an assumption that the humans are the only ones that are the utilizers. And there's not animals. Of course there's animals being utilizers. Animals pollute, animals use resources. I'm ignoring all that. Um, I'm assuming I can measure R of K. That's a pretty big assumption because it is very difficult to measure a, a number of aspects of the environment. Okay? I'm assuming that I, I'm assuming I know everyone's utilization. And why in the world would somebody share their utilization with me? Right? I mean, it's a nice idea, but why would they do that? Because if they're utilizing too much, they want to keep it secret. Just like in the wealth transfer policy, wealth distribution policy. If I have a lot of money and I gotta give it to the poor guy, half my wealth, for instance, I just lie and say I have less wealth and I have to give less away. So there's, there's problems with cheating. Um, we're assuming that everyone would obey the law, which is a huge assumption. If you're, if you just think about how much fighting goes on over in the United States, for instance, over the carb standards on pollution by cars. And, you know, uh, Think about you know how much illegal dumping happens, for instance. And there's all kinds of things for cheating, um, and then I, I assume that RD and RS are known and accurate at this rate, just like you said. I, mean, I when do we really destroy the commons? How bad does the climate have to get before we've done that? And there's people, serious people, arguing now that we've already done it. Okay, that's scary because there's inertia in the system. You understand that, right? I mean, there's inertia in the system. So what we've done up till now won't be seen for a while, and they, they're predicting that it's gonna be really bad, and there's no way to fix it at this point, you know. So um, that's a cause for significant concern. Uh, I think you spend a lifetime um, actually, literally addressing those questions on that slide. I mean, that's really hard, okay? Um, and uh, I'm sure there are many people trying to do that. And it's, if you think about it, it's really important because, uh, well, there's only one planet Earth and that's all we got, so, okay. Any questions about that slide? Um, yeah. Extensions, okay. Um, would a util utilization distribution policy work here? How? 
So what I want you to think about for a minute, just brainstorm. Do you think that rather than what I'm doing now, you guys all have your amount of utilization, and uh, we're gonna set up a topology, a network. Remember what we did that with Wells Distribution, right? Tyler becomes a circle, I become a circle, we have a line, that means we can sense each other's utilization and pass each other to utilization. We set up a neighbor topology here, and we, tr we might even trade. We might sell. I say, I got lots, you know, I, I uh, have lots of utilization I don't need. I'm going to sell some to you. You give me some money, I'll give you my utilization. Sounds like cap and trade, right? So, so we start doing this. What will happen in this network? Do you think that um, we can avoid the tragedy of the commons this way? No, it's, it, this, is, this is different than what we talked about with wealth, right? Because if I hand you utilization, does it mean you're going to use it? Oh. I mean, um, it's, it's more like you're handing somebody the right to pollute or use resources. That's really what you're selling, is rights to do it. But what will end up being used is another question. So actually, I think it's pretty reasonable to, to have this kind of a, a sharing network. I do think, though, that the dynamics are going to be a lot more challenging because you've got the resource utilization dynamics that are going on underneath. Um, we can use democracy, can't we? Yes, we can. I'm in a sustainability class right now, actually, and they talk a lot about how um, a lot of like resource utilization isn't factored into their business plan or their expenses or anything like that. And so it's kind of like it's a monetary externality. And yes. So if you were to implement something like that, I think in one way, like it create it internalizes all of those costs. So I think it would help. But I mean, you have to again, you have to make sure everyone like follows the law. Exactly. Things like that. So if they don't follow the law, law then it's, they're cheating. Yeah. They're, they're grabbing the externality and using it the way we've always used it in the past. Right. But then, like, I think it also would help the regular like, U.S. citizen to understand how much they're actually using because right now we don't see those costs. Like, That's right. corn is like 30 cents a pound or something, but as far as the resources that corn uses, it's a lot more than 30 cents. Exactly. And it would probably skyrocket up to like a dollar. Some of those those numbers, like with corn, uh, uh, are shocking. Uh, well, how much resources it takes to create corn. Or the one that gets me is the potato chip issue. I mean, yeah, check that one out. Go look it up. I forget the numbers, but potato chips are, oh, wow. Uh, they use a lot of water to make a potato chip. It's unbelievable what it takes. So, so yeah. Um, I don't know if everybody gets this term externality is a term from economics. And it's basically something that's not in the budget is one way to think of it. It's kind of, you know, outside. And we've always get it for free. It's like, what's the true cost of driving your car? You're polluting. Well, what's the cost of cleaning that up? It's, it's, there's so many things like that that aren't taken into consideration. Um, so, so, yeah, a lot of people in sustainability talk about trying to internalize costs the term and uh, charge the true cost for things. Woo, that's going to be hard. It's going to be really hard. Um, so next, would a democracy work for policy? Because there's no reason we have to enforce this stuff. Let's all agree to live in a democracy and then let's vote. What's fair, not fair, etc. Uh, I think you really could sit down and take the, the previous democracy simulation uh, along with the, the distribution policy and, and adapt it pretty easily to this environmental problem, okay? Um, and it's going to have different dynamics. It's not going to be the same, okay? It's going to definitely be different. I think it would be actually interesting. Um, next, could a policy based on cooperation work? That is one that uses what's called indirect reciprocity. So let me explain indirect reciprocity in the simplest terms. If, if I give Tyler something, there's a higher likelihood, it's been shown, that he'll give me something. And then we start giving each other stuff, and it's like, it's great. I scratch his back, he scratches his back. It's cool. But here's the thing, what they've shown with humans is the following. If I give Courtney something, and, I, and she doesn't give me anything, and I give her something again, and I am, and I get And he's watching, Tyler's watching me. He said, man, Kevin's a good guy. I'm going to give him something. And it works. He does give me some. This is this is happens in a lot of contexts. 
This is called indirect reciprocity. And the idea is that by giving Courtney something, I'm increasing my reputation. And then people are more likely to help you out then. Now that's a network idea. You see what I mean? It works over topology. You see what I'm saying? Because if I set up this network, then all of you can look around, and your neighbors, if you start giving to someone, the poor guy, everybody looks at you and says, well, you're really nice, you're giving to the poor guy. They're going to be more likely than to give to you. So the question is, is well, if that's true, can, can indirect reciprocity drive um, wealth distribution? Make it work without laws, religion, or anything. Just indirect reciprocity. Okay? That is cool. Question, can you do the same thing for an environmental policy? An environmental policy, you know, it would go like this. Um, and this was suggested in the Rupert Mean, the, the one paper I had used to prepare this lecture. It goes like this. So um, you, you are all watching me, and, and I'm helping the environment. I'm out picking up trash. I'm driving my Prius. I'm doing whatever, okay? I'm helping the environment. And so that what people are intrigued with is, is, wait a minute, if people see me helping the environment, will they help me? It's a type of indirect reciprocity because by helping the environment, I'm helping all of you, right? It, it, at least a little bit. Is that enough to make me help the environment? Because I know you're going to help me if I help the environment. This is something that people are intrigued with. And I don't know what it will take. I mean, I, I don't know... You know, I think that alone is easily a dissertation. I mean, that's a very, very complicated thing. Yes? Could you also say that, let's say, me seeing you, like, can use less, would that make me yes. say, okay, I could use more now? Yes. <laughs> but it depends on, uh, look at it this way. I give, I give, I give. You know, she's accepting. He says I'm going to help him, but she's just like, hey, come on. Give, yeah. give me more. So, yeah, these ideas, uh, the question is, 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 is there corruption in the network, too, essentially, is what you're saying. Nastiness. Of course there's nastiness in the network. Yeah, the answer is yes. But the, um, there's a lot of people that study this cooperation issue, and, and in the end, what they, what they basically say is, with, no matter what your view is about altruism and, you know, nastiness, Humans do tend to cooperate with each other. It comes out. You can find places where people cheat each other, of course. There's all kinds of nastiness in the world. But overall, people are cooperative. Uh, that's what the experiments, I'm talking about psychologists studying this or whatever. Um, and animals are too, by the way. This is not just humans. Many animals are cooperative with each other, help each other out. But uh, you ask yourself the question is, are they really helping each other out? Was I really trying to help Courtney? Guess what? No. I had my mind on him. I want, I want something from him. My, I'm tricky enough to try to give something to her to get something from him. See what I'm saying? So from a certain perspective, it's all nastiness. So this makes me think of some big companies that sometimes sponsor or like big donors for certain like NGOs. Like, I know Kroger's a big donor to the food drive. They talk about it all the time at the basketball games. Are you saying, like, <coughs> so they're trying to get their brand out there and say, hey, we're really good, so you should. Of course. Okay. I don't want to pick on Kroger, but. No. No, they're, they're doing it. They, of course these places are doing this. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely they're doing that. And that's the, the true reasons why, you know, the true motivation. I mean, you, you, I think this is a very personal question for each of you, too, right? This, is, this applies to us in this class in particular. Why are you trying to help? Is it really selfishness or is it really altruism? Ah, that's a tough one. That's too personal a question, though, to ask any one individual, I mean, unless you really know them well, because that, that, that's really a difficult. Um, the responses I, I found over the years um, from individuals it gets very personal, you know, because it, it for well, that's in the book. Remember, in chapter one, I mean, I discuss this, and I don't say why, but it's you know the why question. What I've seen in the answers is is um, pretty surprising, actually. Let me just put it that way, pretty surprising, and uh, 
you know, it's, you can't assume it's all altruism for sure. Okay, yes. Um, just kind of one last thought. I think it's the utilization distribution policy is actually really interesting because if you actually gave every human being an equal amount of like utilization points or whatever that they could use, for the people who don't use them the most, which we generally say are the poorest people, they all of a sudden have capital. Exactly. And they have a way to make money. Exactly. That, and, and it's something that like, I would assume the rich people would really, really want to buy. Absolutely. So I think that's yeah, it, it's, this is why, see I'm, I'm fascinated by this too, because look, let me just say it a different way. You're, you're right on, I mean, remember, remember in these plots, one of the key points is that that in these plots, like this plot right here, look at these are the poor guys down here not, not polluting much. So that, diff, that not polluting much, if they had extra utilization to sell, then they get money, okay, from, from the rich people. So suddenly by, by considering, I think what is intriguing to me is you, you need to consider two variables at least in this context. You need either money and reputation, or uh, utilization and reputation, but you could have three variables, money, utilization, and reputation. I think those three, if you put them together and try to get cooperation to merge, I think beautiful things would happen because of what you're saying. Because what's gonna happen then is, is you're gonna give money to poor people. Of course, when you give them money, they're gonna be rich and then they're gonna start polluting more. And they're not gonna wanna sell as much, right? But, yes? I can see how that wouldn't work. Because say there's big corp corporations that want their utilization, they have money to sit back on. They don't have to buy their utilization from them right away. Whereas if the poor people have the utilization but no one's buying from them because they don't need it right away, they might be willing to sell it for less and less over time just to get something out of it. <sighs> yes, that is a problem because I can starve out the poor people, is what right. you're saying. I can starve them out until they die and then. I get their utilization anyway, is your point, because if they die, then N goes down, and utilization for everybody goes up. It's great to watch how minds think here. That's a nasty way to think, <laughs> That's a nasty way to think Tyler. <laughs> but you're right. <laughs> but I, and this is actually, that's exactly how you do want to think, because you want to, everybody's going to game the system, right? That's, that's what life is about, gaming systems. We do it. I mean, students are fantastic at it in the university, right? <laughs> Professors are even more devious, trust me. Now, everybody's gaming the system, so you gotta, you gotta design something that's robust to that kind of gaming. And uh, that makes the research really fun. Okay, um, that's it.